the forehead of your robot. I'm basically what you call, a collector. I collect Disney movies and place them on shelves in my man cave downstairs. There are many racks full of Disney movies, ranging from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs to Toy Story 4. Trust me, I've become the movie's version of YouTuber Cinemassacre. To continue being a Disney fanatic, I decided to go to Disney's Hollywood Studios, a theme park at the Walt Disney World Resort near Orlando, Florida. With so many Disney vacation packages and options available, there's always a new family experience to discover in Florida, from kid-friendly adventures at Walt Disney World Resort, to grand oceanic escapes aboard the Disney Cruise Line. The resort has several expansion projects planned or ongoing, including Star Wars, Rise of the Resistance attraction, is due to open at Disney's Hollywood Studios on December 5, 2019. Disney Rivera Resort, a new Disney resort opening in December 2019. Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, is replacing the Great Movie Ride, opening at Disney's Hollywood Studios in Spring 2020. A Tron Light Cycle Power Run at Magic Kingdom, is due to open in 2021. Expansion at Epcot, includes new attractions related to Guardians of the Galaxy, Cosmic Rewind, and Ratatouille, and a newly designed entrance due to open by the end of 2021. Reflections, a Disney Lakeside Lodge, a new Disney resort to be opened in 2022. Flamingo Crossings, a shopping complex similar to Disney Springs, opening date to be announced. Star Wars, Galactic Star Cruiser, a new Disney resort, opening date to be announced. Mary Poppins, will be celebrated with a new attraction at the United Kingdom Pavilion at Epcot's World Showcase. I went to Disney's Hollywood Studios with my friends, Scott, Tavis, and Zachary, and rode some rides there, my favorite being the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. Then we went to Hollywood Boulevard to hang out. Hollywood Boulevard, inspired by the real street of the same name, serves as the park's main entrance and operates in the same vein as Main Street USA at Magic Kingdom. It is lined with themed streetscape facades and venues selling Disney merchandise and park services. Guests enter through the main entrance gate, which resembles the Pan Pacific Auditorium. Near the park's gate is a recreation of the Crossroads of the World Tower. Live street entertainment and seasonal parades travel down the main street throughout the day. At the far end of Hollywood Boulevard, stands a replica of Grauman's Chinese Theater. Near the entrance of Animation Courtyard, resides the Hollywood Brown Derby Restaurant, a themed replica of the original Brown Derby Restaurant in Hollywood, California. Then, we went to Echo Lake. Inspired by the similarly named neighborhood in Los Angeles, is designed to mimic the suburban California crazy form of architecture from Hollywood's Golden Age, and is anchored around the area's namesake lake. Echo Lake includes three major attractions based on characters and films created by George Lucas, and produced by Lucasfilm. Star Tours, The Adventures Continue, is a 3D motion simulator ride set in the Star Wars universe. The Jedi Training, Trials of the Temple, a live-action stage show, invites children to become adult learners and receive lightsaber training from a Jedi Master. The live-action Indiana Jones epic stunt spectacular, reenacts various scenes from Steven Spielberg's Raiders of the Lost Ark, while illustrating how professional film stunts are performed. The Hyperion Theater houses for the first time in forever, a Frozen sing-along celebration, a musical show based on Disney's 2013 animated film Frozen. The adjacent ABC Sound Studio building showcases Star Wars Path of the Jedi, a short film retelling of the Star Wars series. Behind these buildings lies a subsection named Commissary Lane, that connects Hollywood Boulevard directly to Grand Avenue and bypasses Echo Lake altogether. In this area, resides the ABC Commissary and the Sci-Fi Dine-In Theater Restaurant, a dinner theater with a retro-style theme featuring vintage car-themed tables, and a large movie screen featuring continuous clips of science fiction films from the 1950s. Grand Avenue is themed as a gentrified historic district, inspired by the real location of the same name in downtown Los Angeles. The area is anchored by Muppet Vision 3D, a 4D film attraction starring the Muppets from Jim Henson's The Muppet Show, that is presented at the Grand Arts Theater within the Avenue's Grand Park, itself also inspired by the real park of the same name. 
Grand Avenue is also home to Pizza Rizzo, a Brooklyn-style pizza restaurant owned by Rizzo the Rat, Mama Melrose's Restaurant Italiano, and Baseline Tap House, a modern California-styled pub. The main street of Grand Avenue leads into a recreation of a Figueroa Street Tunnel which connects to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Grand Avenue was originally planned as a themed area called Muppet Studios, following Disney's acquisition of the Jim Henson Company. In addition to a Muppet Vision 3D, this area was to include a themed restaurant, and a Muppet Dark Ride parody of the Great Movie Ride. The deal fell through after Henson's death, and only Muppet Vision 3D was developed. The realized Muppet themed section became a part of the park's former Streets of America area, which encompassed several attractions, including an urban street amalgamation of New York City and San Francisco. The area's namesake street facades were formerly the park's working backlot set, which was originally a component of the park's inaugural studio backlot tour, and opened to pedestrian park traffic in the mid-1990s. This area closed on April 2, 2016. The Muppet-themed areas, and a single remaining block of the Streets of America facades were reincorporated into a Muppet's courtyard, which served as a placeholder designation, until Grand Avenue was completed in September 2017. Star Wars, Galaxy's Edge, is set within the Star Wars universe, at the Black Spire Outpost Village on the remote frontier planet of Bachu. Attractions include the Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run, a flying simulator attraction that allows guests to pilot the Millennium Falcon through a customized secret mission on behalf of Honda Lanaka and Chewbacca. The forthcoming Star Wars Rise of the Resistance will be a dark ride that places guests in a climactic battle between the First Order and the Resistance. Restaurants and shops include Ogus Cantina, Savvy's Workshop, and Droid Depot. The land opened in 2019, replacing the park's Streets of America section. The 14-acre area cost an estimated $1 billion. Toy Story Land is inspired by Pixar's Toy Story series. The 11-acre area is themed to Andy's backyard with three attractions, each hosted by characters from the series. The attractions include Toy Story Mania, an interactive 4D attraction inspired by classic carnival midway games, Slinky Dog Dash, an outdoor roller coaster, and Alien Swirling Saucers, a spinning teacup ride. The land opened on June 30, 2018. Toy Story Mania was originally a standalone attraction within Pixar Place, an area dedicated to films and characters created by Pixar, resembling the animation studio's Emeryville, California campus. Pixar Place was also the home of Luxo Jr., a six-foot-tall audio-animatronic version of Pixar's desk lamp mascot. The moving character performed periodic shows throughout the day and evening across from Toy Story Midway Mania. Located just outside Toy Story Land is the former Pixar Place area, now known as Munisi Berg, an Incredibles-themed area featuring a merchandise location titled Munisi Berg Gifts, an outdoor vending cart known as the Neighborhood Bakery, and the Edna Mode Experience, which features an Edna Mode meet and greet, and displays of Incredibles costumes in the queue area. Animation Courtyard is home to attractions based on films and characters created by Walt Disney Animation Studios. Its entrance is marked by a square studio arch. This section of the park originally was the starting point for the studio backlot tour. The former Magic of Disney Animation Building hosts Star Wars Launch Bay, a Star Wars exhibit featuring behind-the-scenes props and character meet and greets with Darth Vader, Chewbacca, and BB-8. Mickey Avenue, a subsection of Animation Courtyard, is home to a walkthrough exhibit, Walt Disney Presents, which explores the life and legacy of Walt Disney through photos, models, artifacts, and a short biographical film narrated by Julie Andrews. The Courtyard section also hosts two live shows. Disney Junior Dance Party, entertains guests with characters from the Disney Junior series, including Mickey and the Roadster Racers, Vampirina, Doc McStuffins, and the Line Guard. Across the plaza, Voyage of the Little Mermaid uses glow-in-the-dark puppets, lasers, music, projectors, human actors, and water effects to recreate favorite scenes and songs from the 1989 animated film. Sunset Boulevard, inspired by the real thoroughfare of the same name, was the first expansion of the park, opening in July 1994. The focal point of Sunset Boulevard is the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, a thrill ride based on Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone. 
located nearby is Rock and Roller Coaster starring Aerosmith, an indoor dark and roller coaster themed to the music of Aerosmith, with three inversions and a high-speed launch. Sunset Boulevard has two outdoor amphitheaters and one indoor theater. The covered theater of the stars hosts Beauty and the Beast live on stage, a stage show featuring highlights from the animated film. The larger open-air Hollywood Hills Amphitheater is the home of Fantasmic, a nighttime show featuring Mickey Mouse and many other Disney characters in a story with fireworks, lasers, and water effects. The completely indoor Sunset Showcase hosts Lightning McQueen's Racing Academy, and features Lightning McQueen and other Cars characters teaching rookie racers about the lessons they've learned when racing. While at Sunset Boulevard, there was a guy with a DVD case in his hand. He wore a black baseball cap and glasses. We knew this guy at high school, his name is Earl, and he was the nerd from biology class. As we all know, he's not like those other nerds with the bow ties and nasally voices, he's just like you and me, but he would sit in front of a computer monitor for weeks on end. We walked up to Earl and we said our hellos. Earl claimed that he downloaded a completely different version of a Disney movie someone made from the deep web, which is shocking to us because we never went to the deep web before. Earl continued to claim that he had seen a different version of the Disney film, Bolt, and downloaded it onto his DVD RAM. He wanted to give it to me, and said that it's better to have me upload it to YouTube or Facebook, to show people the dark side of Disney. At first, I didn't know what he meant by the dark side of Disney, but then I suddenly knew what he meant. Disney has done some shady shit throughout history, for instance, in 1938, the Walt Disney Company sent a rejection letter to Mary Ford, stating that girls are not considered for creative positions. The letter was rediscovered in 2009, when Ford's grandson uploaded the image on Flickr. The letter received greater attention on January 7, 2014, when, after congratulating Emma Thompson for her Best Actress win at the National Board of Review Awards, Meryl Streep referenced the letter. Referencing Thompson's film, Saving Mr. Banks, Streep responded. It must have killed, Disney, to encounter a woman, an equally disdainful and superior creature, a person dismissive of his considerable gifts and prodigious output and imagination. In response to Streep's statements, many Disney scholars and artists defended Disney, including Disney legend Floyd Norman, who said, Much has changed, and changed for the better. Other journalists found the speech ironic, noting that Streep just finished filming the then-upcoming Disney film, Into the Woods. The Walt Disney Company has also been criticized for the lack of feminist values seen in the older original Disney princesses. Snow White in particular is under constant criticism for her lack of feminist ideals. The film Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs features the main protagonist who at the time fit the domestic and docile expectations of women in the pre-World War II era. Snow White is displayed on the screen covered in a long dress, embellished with a white collar, puffy sleeves, a red cape, and a red bow constraining her hair, a traditional modest look on femininity by revealing minimal skin. Through her actions portrayed in the movie, she draws on the traditional femininity that was encouraged in 1930s American culture. During the Great Depression, women were encouraged to return to the home and care for the household, a theme that is widely displayed in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. However, with the second resurgence of Disney movies, known as the Disney Renaissance, beginning in 1989 until 1999, Disney transformed the damsel in distress into a strong woman with a desire for adventure. This new approach ushered in a decade of go-getting, proactive heroines, who possessed character traits that coincided with the new era of acceptable sexual roles in a society where women hold the same jobs as men. This is evident in princesses such as Ariel from The Little Mermaid, and Belle from Beauty and the Beast. When we got back to our hotel rooms, we just relaxed and watched reruns of Wizards of Waverly Place on Disney Channel. I was still holding onto the DVD Earl gave us, and I didn't have time to notice the writing on the DVD cover. It read, Bark of Insanity, in Black Sharpie. I guess Earl decided to give this thing another title instead of just Bolt. This interested me, this is a dog pun of, spark of insanity, and it gave me tons of questions like, will this be any good, or is Earl right about this being found on the deep web? 
After the show was over, I asked my friends if we should watch Earl's CD on my laptop, and we looked at each other for a minute, and agreed, seeing that this is Earl we are talking about and that he downloads weird shit all the time. We placed the CD on my laptop, and on screen was the movie Bolt. The movie started with a white shepherd puppy named Bolt, being adopted by an 8-year-old girl named Penny. Five years later, Bolt and Penny star in a hit television series called Bolt, in which Bolt uses various superpowers to protect Penny from the TV show's main villain, Dr. Calico. To gain a more realistic performance, the show's producers have deceived Bolt his entire life, arranging the filming in such a way that Bolt believes everything in the show is real, and that he has superpowers, including a devastatingly powerful sonic scream, called the Super Bark. After a cliffhanger episode causes Bolt to believe Penny has been kidnapped, he escapes from his onset trailer in Hollywood, but knocks himself unconscious, and is trapped inside a box of foam peanuts that are shipped to New York City. This was relatively normal so far, I mean there were no flaws in this CD whatsoever. It's just like the 2008 film, and I thought to myself, why is a movie like this doing in the deepest bowels of the internet? Soon enough, my question was answered. In New York, Bolt resumes his search for Penny, and quickly finds that his superpowers are useless. He encounters Miggins, a feral cat who bullies pigeons out of their food. Bolt compels Miggins to guide him back to Penny, the latter being convinced her captor is a lunatic, and the two start their journey westward by truck. Meanwhile in Hollywood, Penny is distraught over Bolt's disappearance, but is convinced by the studio to continue filming with a less experienced look-alike dog. What caught us off guard, was that when Bolt meets Mittens. Bolt was shown to be more violent and hostile towards Mittens, showing absolute disgust and fury towards her. He did some horrible things to the stray like, punch her, bite her, shriek in her face, you name it. We were blown away at the sudden turn of events, I mean it did go from 1 to 100 very quickly. Even one of our friends, Zachary, flat out says, Holy shit. And starts laughing out of surprise. But what confused us was that, there was no music. Literally. No. Music. But that's not the strangest part. None of the voices matched up with the characters. Bolt didn't sound like his original voice actor, John Travolta. In this scene, he was voiced by another person, specifically, a college student. However this anonymous voice actor was, he did some pretty talented voice acting, he sounded like he was extremely pissed off with Mittens for whatever she must have done. But, what did she do to set him off? The sound effects of this scene were realistic stock sound effects you'd find on YouTube or Soundboard Online, and the sounds of Mittens' anguish were from the sound recordings of someone crying or screaming. Again, you'll find this somewhere on YouTube or whatever. Getting back to the movie, Bolt is being shown by Miggins how to act like a cute but needy dog, obtaining food for them both at an RV park. They are joined by Rhino, a fearless hamster and fanatical Bolt fan. Rhino's unwavering faith in Bolt substantiates the dog's illusions about himself, but allows Miggins to figure out Bolt is from a television show. After the train scene, Miggins climbs up a tree and tries to tell Bolt that he's an actor, but Bolt simply becomes angry, and continues to yell at Miggins in that unknown voice actor's voice to get the fuck down or he'll kill her. And yes, he did say the word, fuck. We knew that this was now getting too adult for little kids, and we stopped the movie right there and pondered about what we saw. I looked at Zachary, who replied quietly. Wow. We took a break and ordered some pizza, and we continue to talk about what happened on that CD, with some ice cold beer. As our pizzas arrived, we felt like we needed to watch the rest of the movie. I was hesitant at first, but Tavis was the person to put it back on. Bolt, freed from the patrol van by Rhino, finally realizes and accepts that he is just a normal dog, but regains his confidence after Rhino, oblivious to this revelation, exhorts him to heroism. They rescue Miggins from the shelter, and as they continue west, Bolt and Miggins form a close friendship, in which she teaches Bolt how to be an ordinary dog and enjoy typical dog activities. The movie was normal, as you'd see from the original film, but what caught us off guard was that the musical number, Barking at the Moon by Jenny Lewis, was changed to The Headless Waltz by Voltaire. 
Biggins make plans for the three of them to stay in Las Vegas, but hearing Bolt is still drawn to find Penny, tells him Penny is only an actor, and humans never truly love their pets, and eventually betray and abandon them, as happened to her. What happens next, really blew us away honestly. The music stops again, and Bolt began to growl. But this time, he was shaking, and foaming at the mouth, and glared at Biggins with an expression of maniacal rage. Biggins were now backing away with fear in her eyes. It stayed like this throughout the entire scene, until it cuts to another scene. Bolt reaches the studio and finds Penny embracing his lookalike, unaware that Penny still misses him and her affection for the lookalike is only a part of a rehearsal. A broken-hearted Bolt leaves, but Biggins, who was supposed to be on a gantry in the studio, and the roof, wasn't there. The music stops, and he then looks up at the studio and has that menacing glare again. This time not growling or foaming. Bolt rushed in during the studio's screening, and attacked the cast members, the special effects crew, and shockingly enough, Penny herself. He mauled them all, and knocks over some flaming torches, setting the sound stage on fire with the corpses lying dead inside, with gore around them. By now the scene fades into view, and Bolt goes back to Las Vegas, and by now we saw what happened to Miggins. She lay in her box, shaking like a leaf. She was covered in bruises and scars, her eyes swollen and purple, and missing a few teeth. Her eyes welled up with tears, and she was saying, God, get me out of here, which is a recording taken from Stephen King's Hugo. By that time, we now knew what happened, but didn't want to say what Bolt did. Cause, by this time, you already knew what happened. He did some very very upsetting and anger-inducing stuff to her, that it would even make Jeffrey Dahmer himself look like the sanest man alive. By this time, the film ended with a quote. It is not the bruises on the bodies that hurt. It is the wounds of the heart and the scars on the mind. From, Asia Mirza. We ejected the CD and placed it back in the case. I got on the phone with Earl. I wanted to know what the hell was going on. The conversation went like this. Hello. Earl, this is Tyler. I need to talk to you about the movie you downloaded. Oh shit. Is it that bad? That's bad. Ugh. Look, I didn't mean to give it to you, I just wanted you to upload it to YouTube and shit. Ugh, Jesus Christ Earl. Why us? Can't you do it yourself? We don't need to be your little test monkeys, just upload it yourself, you got a YouTube channel right? Yeah, but my computer got a damaging virus after I downloaded the movie onto the CD, and I don't want to damage my computer any further. That's why I'm asking you guys to do it for me, just until I boot up my computer again. No way dude, I don't want the same virus on my laptop. Besides, I upload some pornography to which I masturbate. Dude, I'm a Christian. Sorry, but that's the truth. Anyway, I understand your concern, and you don't have to upload it if you want. Just put it in your collection, that way when you do view it again, it would be a sight to behold. I'll think about it. Thanks. I hung up the phone, much relieved that Earl was as shocked about the film as we were. Months later, we went back home to Atlanta, Georgia, and I put the CD among my other collections. I did think about viewing the CD again, and this time, recording the full film with my video camera, but I decided against it, thinking that no other person should relieve the same moments we went through. Besides, if I did that, then that'll be going up against YouTube's community guidelines, and I do not want a strike on my channel. The CD is still on my rack to this day, and I still don't know if I should upload the film online. Who knows, since YouTube's going down the drink, maybe it'll gain a million views, and stay on the platform. Because after all, it is from the deep web, and stories about the deep web have been growing more infamous ever since. I still remember the contents of the movie and let me tell you, it still haunts me to this day. But still, I have done reviews of it in one of my vlogs, and this is what came up. Cats are perceived as feminine, so it's like abusing women. With that said, people would say that dogs have a real, loving, affectionate relationship with you. I've had dogs that loved me more than themselves. Cats don't do that. They look at people as a provider of resources, which is not true due to facts I picked up from veterinarians. 
As a cat lover, I find this film very misogynistic, which is why I said that cats are perceived as feminine, and that they get the torment they receive from men, which is why they're perceived as dogs. Dogs and cats hate each other in the film industry, which has been used in so many movies, shows, and even YouTube videos. So, I guess this comes to show you that women, ethnic minorities, and even cats, have it rough in the movie business. And because of that, it makes me feel bad for them. For anyone who's reading this, no I don't know who made this, nor do I have any clues to the original creator of the film. Whoever he is, he's damn good at CGI and voice acting. I'm looking at the CD now, and I might just upload it to YouTube, and get it over with.